The central nervous system contains the brain and the spinal cord, which is a fibrous, rope-like structure. The other division, the peripheral nervous system, consists of thousands of nerves that connect the spinal cord to muscles and sensory receptors. The peripheral nervous system is responsible for reflexes, which help the body to avoid serious injury, and also for the fight or flight response, which is protective when facing stress or danger. Let's magnify a peripheral nerve to examine an individual neuron up close. Here is a peripheral nerve. Each one of the nerve bundles, or fascicles, contains hundreds of individual nerve fibers. Here's an individual neuron with its dendrites, axon, and cell body. The dendrites are the tree-like structures. Their job is to receive signals from other neurons and from special sensory cells that tell us about our surrounding environment. The cell body is the headquarters of the neuron, containing its genetic information in the form of DNA. The axon transmits signals away from the cell body to other neurons. Certain neurons, called motor neurons, are responsible for voluntary control of the muscles all over the body. Many neurons, including motor neurons, are insulated like pieces of electrical wire. This insulation protects them and also allows their signals to move faster along the axon. Without this insulation, signals from the brain might never reach the outlying muscle groups in the limbs. The operation of the nervous system depends on the flow of communication between neurons. For an electrical signal to travel between two neurons, it must first be converted to a chemical signal, which then crosses a space of about a millionth of an inch wide. The space is called a synapse, and the chemical signal is called a neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitters allow the billions of neurons in the nervous system to communicate with one another, making the nervous system the master communication system of the body. How does the pain you experience when you burn your hand result so quickly in an action by your muscles? Many animals respond to environmental stimuli using specialized cells called neurons. A stimulus is detected by sensory receptors and the body responds through motor effectors. These cells working together allow you to respond very quickly to threats. When you touch something hot, Heat receptors of a sensory neuron detect the stimuli and send the information of heat to an interneuron in your central nervous system. From there, a motor neuron sends a response from your central nervous system to the skeletal muscles in your arm, causing them to contract and pull your hand away. The fundamental process of neural transmission that underlies this action occurs in all neurons of the body. Neurons transmit this information through changes in the electrical potential of the membrane by the movement of ions across the membrane. An electrochemical gradient governs the movement of these ions, resulting in an electrical impulse. The resting membrane potential in a neuron, when the cell is not firing an impulse, is established by the unequal distribution of sodium ions outside of the cell and potassium ions inside the cell making the outside of the cell more positively charged compared to the inside. The electrochemical gradient is established and maintained by an enzyme called sodium-potassium ATPase. When a neuron is stimulated, sodium ion channels open and sodium ions flow into the cell. This leads to a change in the electrical potential across the membrane called depolarization. The depolarizing electrical potential travels down the dendrites and over the cell body. Multiple electrical potentials will combine at the axon hillock in a process called summation. If the depolarization is large enough, an action potential is triggered. Action potentials are all or none electrical impulses that maintain their amplitude and strength down the length of the axon. The action potential travels down the axon when the depolarization of an area of membrane causes adjacent voltage-gated sodium ion channels to open. The influx of sodium ions results in membrane depolarization along the membrane. After a short delay, potassium ion channels open and potassium ions flow out, repolarizing the membrane. For the neuron to fire again, the resting membrane potential needs to be re-established. 
Sodium-potassium ATPase is used to move sodium and potassium ions against their concentration gradients, re-establishing the resting membrane potential. As the action potential moves down the axon, ions are diffusing only a short distance, allowing the signal to move quickly. At the axon terminal, the electrical impulse passes to another cell at a cellular connection called a synapse. The space between the presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic cell is called the synaptic cleft. The presynaptic neuron contains signal molecules called neurotransmitters that are packaged inside vesicles. When an action potential reaches the end of a neuron, neurotransmitters are released by exocytosis from the neuron into the synaptic cleft. Neurotransmitters bind to the adjacent cell at receptor sites attached to ion channels. The channels open, allowing the movement of ions into or out of the effector cell, which alters its membrane potential, thereby transmitting the signal from the neuron to the effector cell. Because nerve impulses move very rapidly down the axon of a neuron and move from cell to cell across synapses, you react quickly to a stimulus, like burning your finger. Many dental procedures are potentially painful. If the nerve impulse reaches the patient's brain, it's interpreted as being painful. How does the nerve conduct this impulse to the brain, and how do local anesthetics act to prevent this from happening? Sensory neurons that conduct pain are composed of three major parts, the axon, the dendrite, and the cell body. The single nerve fiber, or the axon, is a long cylinder of axoplasm which is encased in a thin sheath, the nerve membrane, which separates the axoplasm from the extracellular fluids. In some nerves, this membrane itself is covered by an insulating lipid-rich layer of myelin. There are constrictions along the myelin called nodes of Ranvier. At these nodes, the nerve membrane is exposed directly to the extracellular fluid. At rest, there are differences in the concentrations of ions found inside and outside the nerve. The inside of the neuron is relatively negatively charged compared to the outside of the nerve. When stimulated, sodium channels open permitting the rapid influx of sodium ions into the interior of the nerve cell. The interior of the cell becomes positively charged as the sodium ions rapidly enter into the cell, a process we call depolarization. Then the process of repolarization starts, with the active transport of potassium ions out of the nerve cell to restore the resting equilibrium. In non-myelinated nerves, the impulse moves forward by a sequential depolarization of short adjoining membrane segments. In myelinated nerves, the impulse leaps forward from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier, a much more rapid conducting process called saltatory conduction. The propagated nerve impulse reaches the brain where it is interpreted by the patient as pain. How do local anesthetics act to prevent the nerve impulse from reaching the brain? Locals act by blocking sodium channels so that when the nerve is stimulated, sodium ions cannot enter into the cell, thereby preventing depolarization. The local anesthetic is deposited as close as possible to the nerve and by diffusion enters into the nerve. Local anesthetic outside the nerve diffuses into an uncharged and a charged ionic form. It is only the uncharged form that is lipid soluble and is able to diffuse through the nerve membrane and into the nerve cell. Outside the nerve, only charged ions remain, and some redissociate into uncharged ions, which can then enter into the nerve. Theoretically, all the charged ions eventually become uncharged, but because there are lymphatics and blood vessels in the surrounding tissues, a quantity of local anesthetic will never enter into the nerve. On the inner surface of the nerve, some of the uncharged ions redissociate into the charged form. These charged ions enter into sodium channels attaching to drug receptor sites, blocking the entry of sodium into the nerve when it is stimulated. This prevents the propagation of the nerve impulse. The impulse does not reach the brain and pain does not occur. When enough local anesthetic is diffused into the nerve, impulse conduction is stopped and the patient is anesthetized.
how do local anesthetics stop working? Eventually, an equilibrium occurs between the amount of anesthetic inside and outside the nerve. As the anesthetic outside the nerve continues to diffuse away from the nerve in blood vessels and lymphatics, the concentration gradient changes with less anesthetic outside than inside, and the local anesthetic begins to diffuse out of the nerve. Eventually, there is not enough local anesthetic left within the nerve to adequately block nerve conduction, and the patient slowly begins to feel again. This process is termed redistribution. The local anesthetic is still in the patient's body as an active drug, but is simply not in the nerve in a high enough concentration to fully block nerve conduction. Cetacane topical anesthetic gel is indicated for anesthesia of surface tissue, making it appropriate for use pre-injection or during procedures which require only anesthesia of the surface tissue. The unique pump top dispenser controls the amount of gel dispensed and eliminates cross-contamination of the contents. To dispense a bead of gel, place index and middle fingers on each side of the center orifice and depress the pump. A cotton tip applicator can then be swiped across the top of the pump to gather the gel for application. Tissues need not be dried prior to application of cetacane gel. Apply gel directly to the site where pain control is required. Because of its ointment-like consistency, the gel applies evenly and consistently and melts at body temperature to absorb quickly into the tissue. Onset of anesthesia is within 30 seconds and duration is typically 30 to 60 minutes. Topical anesthetics in dentistry and dental hygiene to anesthetize or numb oral mucous membranes. Procedures in which we find topical anesthetics helpful in making our patients more comfortable in dentistry and dental hygiene include their use before dental hygiene therapies such as scaling and root planing, known as SRP, before exposing dental radiographs or taking dental impressions, before injections for local anesthetic, or placing retraction cord, and sometimes for other procedures confined to the oral mucosal tissue. There are a number of types of topical anesthetics currently in use in dentistry and dental hygiene and on the market at this time. Here, we have shown a benzocaine gel topical anesthetic, a lidocaine topical anesthetic patch, topical anesthetic spray, and also lidocaine cream. Lidocaine can be used as a topical anesthetic as well as a dental injectable anesthetic and is often provided as a cream for topical anesthetics, although lidocaine cream is usually used on the skin. Occasionally we use lidocaine as a topical anesthetic in the mouth, but it is also available as a spray, liquid, or pastille lozenge. Oracix, which is a eutectic mixture that we call EMLA, is a mixture of both lidocaine and prilocaine at 2.5% concentration each. Benzocaine gel, usually available at a 20% strength, is one of the most commonly used topical anesthetics used in dentistry. Most dental health care providers use topical anesthetics, known as topical, before injecting the patient with a local anesthetic to make the injection more comfortable. Let's explore a little more about benzocaine's chemistry and pharmacokinetics. The chemical form of benzocaine is the ester form. This means that benzocaine is metabolized by an enzyme in the bloodstream called plasma cholinesterase. We generally say that benzocaine is metabolized in the plasma when we refer to its metabolism. Remember the ADME we talked about in pharmacology? ADME, which stands for Absorption, Distribution, Metabolism, and Excretion. We will be using the same concepts of pharmacokinetics for all of the anesthetics in this class that we discussed in pharmacology as they apply to all drugs and medications. 
Absorption of benzocaine is through the skin or mucous membranes, and distribution occurs through the bloodstream. Metabolism occurs in the plasma by the enzyme cholinesterase, and excretion is through the kidneys. In addition to ADME and the chemical properties of each anesthetic agent, we will be talking about the onset, duration, maximum dose, as well as the safety and complications of topical anesthetics. For benzocaine, the onset is fairly quick at 30 seconds to 2 minutes. There is some individual variation with different individuals. Because of this variation, we usually hold the topical anesthetic in place for two full minutes to assure that the patient has soft tissue numbness before injecting any dental local anesthetics. Unfortunately, benzocaine is sometimes associated with a complication or condition called met hemoglobinemia. Methemoglobinemia is a condition in which the blood cells are unable to bind to oxygen effectively. The red blood cells and the person become a bluish tinge due to lack of oxygen. This can be a very dangerous condition. The FDA sent out a warning about methemoglobinemia recently. They were very concerned about the topical anesthetic sprays used in the mouth most of which are formulas containing benzocaine. These agents, when sprayed in the oral cavity and pharynx, had a much higher incidence of methemoglobinemia. Medical emergency procedures must be undertaken if your patient should show a bluish tinge to their skin, known as methemoglobinemia. Be sure that you evaluate the medical history very thoroughly to see if the patient has a history of methemoglobinemia. If that is the case, we would not use benzocaine topical anesthetic with that patient. Topical anesthetics can also be of concern because they have the ability to relax the gag reflex and allow regurgitated stomach contents or oral secretions to enter the airway. Allergic reactions may also occur and are more common with ester anesthetics than with the amide anesthetics. Ester anesthetics are metabolized through degradation to a para-aminobenzoic acid, often known as PABA. We call breakdown products of various compounds metabolites when they are broken down in the body. PABA is a metabolite of para-aminobenzoic acid and also is a metabolite of methylparaben, a preservative that some local anesthetics may contain. As we said earlier, the most commonly used topical anesthetic in dentistry is 20% benzocaine gel. Benzocaine is an ester form of anesthetic that has a typical onset of 30 seconds to 2 minutes. Cetacaine also produces a 20% benzocaine spray that is often used prior to dental radiographs or dental impressions. One of the problems with a topical anesthetic liquid is that the liquid does not stay in the gingival sulcular area. It runs off and the patient tells you their tongue is numb or the back of their throat is numb, but you do not have soft tissue anesthesia in the sulcus where you need it while you're scaling and root planing. To solve that problem, Oricix has come out with a new anesthetic for this purpose. Oricix is a fairly new product that we use as a gingival sulcular anesthetic for dental hygiene procedures such as scaling and root planing. It is indicated for patients who have soft tissue sensitivity only. Oricix is ideal for gingival sulcus topical anesthesia because it has a more rapid onset and a greater depth of penetration. It generally lasts longer than a typical topical anesthetic. The mixture of lidocaine and prilocaine is called a eutectic mixture. This is a compound or a mixture of two elements or chemical compounds 
that have a lower melting temperature than any of their individual components. By mixing these two anesthetics together, we can change the chemical properties of the mixture. Now we have a mixture with a lower melting temperature. Oricix is a periodontal gel made up of 2.5% lidocaine and 2.5% prilocaine. Both of these anesthetics are amide anesthetics. Amide anesthetics are metabolized in the liver and excreted by the kidney. Unlike ester anesthetics, which are metabolized by plasma cholinesterase. The onset of oricix is about 30 seconds with a duration of 14 to 31 minutes. The maximum recommended dose, or MRD, is about five cartridges. Usually, you will use about one half of one cartridge at a single scaling and root planing, or SRP appointment. This makes oricix a very safe topical anesthetic. Oricix is indicated for use when you have a patient who has soft tissue discomfort while you're performing scaling and root planing or even probing. In fact, a patient who has significant discomfort during probing and exploring tells you that this is a good indication for a patient with some form of anesthetic, whether it's topical anesthetic or even local anesthetic. Remember, Oricix is only for use with adult patients who have soft tissue sensitivity. Oricix will not address any hard tissue sensitivity such as dentin sensitivity during scaling and root planing in very deep pockets. Oricix is not to be used for children or for pregnant or nursing mothers and you must check the medical history to make sure that your patient does not have a history of met hemoglobinemia before using Oricix. You should not use it for patients with a history of met hemoglobinemia. To use Oricix, load the cartridge as shown in the film on the company's website, similar to what we showed in class. Then apply the Oricix forms a non-injectable gel anesthetic that is indicated for adults who require local anesthesia in periodontal pockets during scaling and or root planing. The active ingredients of Oricix include 2.5% lidocaine and 2.5% prilocaine gel in a one-to-one -one ratio with synthetic poloxamers as thermosetting agents in addition to hydrochloric acid and purified water. Together with the lidocaine and prilocaine, the poloxamers form a low viscosity fluid system at room temperature and an elastic gel in the periodontal pocket. Oricix should be kept at room temperature and when it is administered, it should be in a liquid state. An easy way to ensure it's still in a liquid state is to tip the cartridge. When Oricix is in a liquid state, the air bubble visible in the cartridge will move as you tip it. If gelation has occurred, the bubble will be stationary. To revert back to a liquid state, simply cool the cartridge by running it under cool water or by placing it in the refrigerator for a brief period of time. The Oricix gel is applied in its liquid form by using a specially designed blunt tip applicator. This thermosets to an elastic gel state within the periodontal pocket. Gelation occurs at body temperature followed by release of the lidocaine and prilocaine. A 30 second onset allows clinicians to begin instrumentation right away. Waiting longer does not enhance the anesthetic effect. The average duration of Oricix is approximately 20 minutes, typically enough time to treat multiple teeth. Plus, Oricix is site specific. This coupled with its abbreviated period of anesthetic effect eliminates residual post-operative numbness. Typically, one cartridge of Oricix or less will be sufficient for one quadrant, but the range is one quarter to two and a half cartridges per quadrant. Up to eight grams of Oricix was well tolerated in efficacy and safety studies, establishing the maximum recommended dosage of five cartridges per session. Assembling the Oricix dispenser is simple. 
To begin the assembly, remove the plastic cover from the cartridge penetrating end of the cannula. Attach the blunt tip applicator to the tip of the dispenser. The cartridge may be loaded into the tip or the body of the dispenser. Reset the internal ratchet mechanism. This is accomplished by resetting the mechanism reset button towards the back end of the body. Carefully assemble the body and tip of the dispenser with the cartridge in place. Holding the dispenser in front of you, rotate the tip sleeve section until tightened and locked in place. To improve access to the periodontal pocket, bend the applicator tip using the cap. If a bend greater than 45 degrees is desired, a double bend technique is recommended. Orkix is effectively applied in moderate to deep pockets as demonstrated here on tooth number three, which has a six millimeter pocket depth. Apply Orakix around the gingival margin of the teeth you have selected using the blunt tip applicator included in the package. Pause for 30 seconds before subgingival application. Then go back and fill the periodontal pockets with Orakix until the gel becomes visible around the gingival margin. In order to achieve anesthesia to the depth of the pocket, skillfully walk the blunt tip applicator around the base of the pocket. Pause 30 seconds before beginning instrumentation. It is important to note that the water spray from ultrasonics will not wash away the anesthetic effect. What we are observing is the application of Aura Kicks on tooth number four with a five millimeter pocket. First is the application to the marginal gingiva. Pause for 30 seconds before subgingival application. Insert the cannula to the base of the pocket and dispense or kicks. After the 30 second onset, the area can be rinsed prior to instrumentation if so desired. As you can see here, thorough instrumentation is very possible with or kicks. In some patients with heavy calculus, it may be necessary to apply Orakix in two stages. The heavy calculus on these teeth makes subgingival application of Orakix into the periodontal pockets very difficult. In these situations, remove the heavy supragingival calculus to allow entry into the subgingival space. Removing the heavy supragingival calculus allowed the clinician subgingival access to place Orakix into the periodontal pocket. Pause 30 seconds before beginning instrumentation. As you can see here, a two-stage application of Orakix on a patient with heavy calculus allows for very thorough instrumentation. Typically, Aura Kicks provides adequate comfort to adult patients during anesthesia in the periodontal pockets during scaling and replaning procedures. However, in clinical trials, a limited number of patients required an injection of anesthetic in addition to Aura Kicks. Preparing the Aura Kicks dispenser for the next patient is very simple. To disassemble, rotate the tip sleeve section and remove the empty cartridge and then dispose of the cartridge and the blunt tip applicator in an infectious waste container for sharps. If necessary, wipe the surface of the dispenser to remove any debris, blood, or saliva that may be present and disinfect the surfaces of the device. Place the tip and the body into an appropriately sized autoclave bag that is well sealed. Autoclave the tip and the body at 134 degrees centigrade for 12 minutes at a minimum pressure.